I am Paul Zelensky and will be your facilitator for this hour-long conversation. This week's WMU Cooley conversation topic is homeland and national security and how it relates to the rule of law. We also want to talk about leadership as it relates to current events. Our special guest um, is Brigadier General, Associate Dean, and Professor Michael McDaniel. And he will have some initial comments and then we will transition into a Q&A. And we ask that you submit your questions in the chat on the screen as we move along. It goes without saying, <clears throat> we are in tenuous, challenging, and extremely difficult times in our country, and in the world for that matter. And we're all immersed in a pandemic that is now months long. We continue to see black citizens being killed by police, protests on our streets, and our government invoking the Insurrection Act by calling on our military to be used on our citizens. And we have just the right person today with us, and that's General Michael McDaniel, a leader in our community and Homeland Security and National Security expert for the next hour or so. We will talk about and identify issues and explore options for moving forward. You can read more about Professor McDaniel at the WMU Cooley website. We will post his bio in the chat. This conversation, again, will only be worthwhile and helpful if you are active participants. We encourage you to ask questions in the chat while Professor McDaniel makes his comments, and then we can let the conversation continue. So, Dean McDaniel, let's start with the leadership question. You've been a military leader. You've been, as a Brigadier, Brigadier General, a White House appointee to the Pentagon, a community leader, a dean of the law school, and, of course, an attorney. Let's string all that is happening now that so many of us are having difficulty making sense of, and it's become almost overwhelming. The pandemic again, the killing of black Americans, protests, and the list goes on. So here's the question. What kind of leadership is important in times like this? Uh, thank you, Dr. Zelensky. Uh, wow, so there's a lot to pack into that. Uh, first, I would, uh, I, when, I, when you say that, I, th I think of the old uh, adage or, or saying from Peter Drunk Drucker, who was a uh, management uh, and institutional organizations guru. And he said, uh, only three things happen naturally in organizations, confusion, frustration, and underperformance. All else requires a leader. And I think that's really true, not just in a very discreet organization, but it's true in the country as well. When you think of the list, everyone, uh, of, of the current events that, that Dr. Zelensky just listed for us, a lot of those involve polarization. They involve ide ideological, political, or racial polarization at a time uh, greater than we've ever had. So when you think about what's required of a leader, uh, you have to think about the different types of leadership. And really, there's lots of different styles, but it, it boils down to this. You're either a transformational leader or a transactional leader. You want to be a transformational leader. You want to transform. You want to change. You want to be on that forefront of leading change. Transactional is you do this for me, I'll do that for you. It doesn't get us down the road. It's being a shopkeeper, not a leader. So for transformational leadership, first thing you have to have is you have to have an understanding of the problem. Now, it may be for the leader that the problem is not, uh, is not acute, it's not urgent, it's not seen by everyone. And so we say, as we used to say in the military, you have to be able to see over the horizon. You have to understand what's coming next. A good leader is looking always, not just to current events, but reactions to current events. And they're looking, as we used to say, those faint signals, those faint radio signals and say, what really is going to happen next? And a true leader starts with being able to see that. It may be, of course, that there's a problem smack dab in your face and you're more of a problem solver. But whichever it is, you have to uh, first, if necessary, create that sense of urgency. Second, convey that confidence that you can uh, attack, address this problem and be willing to do so. Many times that's half the battle. Next, you have to be able to frame your solution. We call it strategic vision, and that's if we're looking over the horizon or if we see a problem right in front of us. Either way, you've got to be able to frame what your, your response is going to be. How are you going to confront that problem? Third, you've got to be able to communicate that problem. And more importantly, your solution to it. You've got to be able to define it and explain to other people, here is how we're going to address this. The next step is probably the most important you have to be able to empower others to take pieces of that. 
you've got to have the right people for the right for the right pieces of that uh, and have them sort of address that and being able to keep that you know you're doing two things at the operational level got to have the right people doing the right part of the problem and at the strategic level you have to say yep this is all this we're, we're addressing all parts of this the most important part there is twofold it is as i always say you hire talent you don't hire necessarily with somebody with expertise you just hire the person with talent you know that person that 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 has that ability to 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 grasp what this, the problem is what you want to do to fix that and how to fix that and says yep i can adapt i can innovate and i can figure this out and that could also mean when you talk about hiring talent that can also mean you're looking at scientific engineering medical whatever the problem could be you're looking at those experts and of course you listen to those experts you have to be willing as the leader to say my job is to keep the big picture their job is to focus on solutions to these steps you have broken it down into steps and you have to be able to accomplish those steps so create the vision communicate the vision empower others to act and then you got to create the short-term wins um, and that that has to happen with the leader uh, i'll give you just one example um, in February of 2016, uh, I was sort of selected by both the governor of the state of Michigan and by the mayor of the city of Flint to lead the lead pipe remediation issues there. And I needed a short term uh, fix. I needed a short term win. And the reason I needed that was it was a way to bring both sides together. Um, you could say I was creating a photo op, but I was, but what I was really doing was creating a, 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 a close short wind that everybody could, could see right away. At that point in time, I didn't have buy-in from either side that the solution was to replace all the lead service lines. And I didn't know how big the problem was in terms of lead service lines, but I had an EPA expert tell me off the record that if you want to fix lead poisoning in the city of Flint, you've got to go to where the lead is. And the greatest concentration of lead was in those in the service lines, the lines between the main at the street and, and your tap in the house and they come into the house. Too many of them were lead, but we didn't know how many. So I knew that I've got to figure out that number. I've got to get both sides to, to concentrate on that issue and, and adopt that issue. Uh, and then I needed to start a process for doing that. So I, I got both sides to agree that we would do a pilot, that we would do just 30 lines around the city. We would just sort of pick randomly pick 30 houses. Um, and it was sort of based upon water data from a uh, Department of Environmental Quality as it was called at that time. And when we did that, then we had everybody else out there, the city, uh, the reporters, the state uh, through DEQ were there and they watched uh, and I brought in Board of Water and Light from Lansing, and they pulled one of the first lines out. Everybody see it's lead, sees how easily we can pull it out of the ground. And as a result, they said, okay, that's the first step. All right, we're going to do these 30. And what will we do next? Well, you know, then next I asked for uh, uh, funds from the state, you know, said, give me $5 million and let me just try and do a couple hundred of these. And so it grows exponentially until everybody is in stride, everybody's in rhythm. And everybody is seeing, okay, that's the goal after all. It's not to sort of fight with each other over how many lead service lines or how, what, who fault, whose fault it is, is to remove all the lead service lines in the city of Flint. So it's that sequential organization that the leadership has to keep in mind to attack whatever the problem is, Paul, that you have to have. Um, what, I was, what I was saying is that, um, you know, obviously the Flint water crisis was, is a complicated issue and that you were you know, yeah. at the forefront of. Um, and, and I want to go back to the idea of framing the solution that you were talking about earlier. Now, in, in the simplest forms, you can look at the Flint water crisis as a singular solution that you've got to solve with many different parts to it. When we're in a situation now where you have a pandemic, um, a, a racial crisis, if you've got big ticket items that, that we as a society are dealing with, health care issues, all those kinds of things that are there. So how do you frame a solution for an organization? In this case, it might be a country, but it could be you know, an organization that's facing you know, financial or human resource or you know, product issues or whatever it might be. How do you frame a solution that has 
multifaceted that, that aren't necessarily connected to one another, or maybe they are all connected. I'm sure they're all connected in some way, but that doesn't mean that you should become trying to come up with some, you know, uh, masterful, broad, complex tapestry that is going to connect all the pieces together and, and solve all of those. That's a perfect example of how you've got to chunk it down into in, into sizable bits that different organizations and experts can handle. Um, some of these require, obviously, we talk about racial injustice, racial polarization in this country. That requires a national conversation, and it requires that conversation on so many levels. And I think what that what that really shows me or demonstrates to me is that need for people to step up and be leaders at very at many many uh, different levels. Uh, but when you talk about, you know, you, you talk about the pandemic from COVID-19, you know, there's an example where you've got to have national leadership. Uh, the, I've said so many times uh, that this was not a new new issue. Uh, when I was at the Pentagon, you know, we were, you know, we had uh, we had H1N1 while I was there and we developed a plan um, to, to respond to H1N1. It's a, it's an infectious respiratory uh, disease that could have become a pandemic. And by the way, when we did that, we, we relied upon the playbook that we had from SARS. So it's, it's not like these events are truly black swans that takes everybody by surprise. The expertise in these areas is there. Uh, and in, in the Pentagon, our expertise was in planning and in logistics. And in, in both cases, you know, we looked at the Centers for Disease Control and they explained to us what needed to be done. What was, you know, what were the steps necessary to contain the pandemic or the potential pandemic in those cases? And we were able to do that. So the point is that, uh, again, it goes to talent. It goes to letting people uh, do their pieces, but you've got to have that unifying vision. Uh, and that's what we should have had, I think, in this case from the White House. You know, there were there were plans out there, as I said. Uh, there were those in government at CDC, Pentagon, and and Homeland Security who could who could step in uh, and 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 sort of say this is the way to do it. And it was a great opportunity to step step up really and unify, you know, all all efforts of government, uh, you know, and all levels of government towards one solution. Instead, what we basically said was, we're leaving it to the governors to fix this up, fix this. And in most cases, the governors did. But, you know, we have a strategic national stockpile ever since the anthrax scare. Uh, it sort of in, in 2002 that was really bumped up. And it was for this reason, because no state can afford to have all these resources. And, and the, the, the theory was you wouldn't need it uh, nationwide. It would be a regional pandemic and you would rush it to those uh, areas where it was needed when uh, those states were overwhelmed. Uh, instead, uh, we, had, we, we didn't have a clear logical pattern and plan of how we were going to uh, distribute the necessary elements from the strategic national stockpile. And we ended up having these these governors sort of fighting with each other and and fighting with the and, and fighting with the federal government as to who's going to get the resources. Uh, you tell them to all buy it in the market. Well, we've we've lost that ability to work together and oh, assure that we all get a fair price and we all get get a fair yeah. portion of the yeah. of these limited resources. Yeah, can can you take us inside? Uh, you you talked about the N one experience that you had at the Pentagon. So and and it, and it's not necessarily identical to, to the COVID-19 situation at all. But, but so you've got these different government and military entities that all have a role to play in, in solving this issue, in, in this case, the pandemic. How does that happen? Like say, you know, logically I would think as a, as a, as a you know, just kind of as a citizen, okay, well the CDC should take the lead on this. It makes sense to me. But, but how does that get worked out within the inner parts of the government with you know, the Pentagon, the Homeland Security, yeah. CDC, the White House, you know, obviously there's Congress. How does how does that all behind the scenes work? Yeah, uh, that's a great question because you know w before I was there, being the state homeland security advisor, I understood you know the the inter that inter i n t e r interagency process. But until you're there and you're in the midst of it, you don't realize how pervasive it is. So um, there are there are layers within the federal government across different agencies that work together all the time. So below my level, you know, there would be the there'd be the prince there would be the, the the director level that they would sort of 
uh, be talking about something and they would promote a plan and they would get input all the way across uh, levels of government. And then it would come up to, to my level, the deputy assistant secretary, and we would do the same thing and we'd push it out to the assistant secretaries and then it would go to the deputies and then it would go to the principals, the cabinet level, so that there was buy-in by everybody of their role and everybody knows the role and everybody else's role. So using the, that sort of vague process with H1N1, um, we knew uh, that we had to use FEMA because FEMA has the contacts within every state. The state Homeland Security Advisor, whoever's been designated, each state has to designate an individual to be that contact with the federal government. And each state, you know, every, every new governor is gonna learn that right away because they wanna be able to react in an emergency as quick as possible. So we use the FEMA, we use the structure that's already there. And at that point, uh, Health and Human Services, of which CDC is a part of, is elevated sort of to that same level. And everybody else is in, in the support role. So Health and Human Services is saying, this is what we need to do. FEMA is, is uh, uh, assuring that the contacts are made. They're, 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 they're the communication branch and that everybody else was in support. Yeah, is there consensus or is there an arm wrestling contest? Who decides that suddenly FEMA should be in charge? How does that happen? Yeah, well, you, you know, there often is, but that's why we have these different levels within the interagency process. You know, as it works its way up, everybody's going to fight about it and somebody may lead on something and, and somebody else might be more involved later on in another, another area. It really works, uh, uh, depends upon who has the greatest knowledge and efficiency in an area. And, yeah. and, and that sort of prevails. I mean, if everybody's working towards the same goal and go, yeah, you guys got it. Yeah. You know, I didn't prep you on this and we want to get to the rule of law and, and the role yeah. of lawyers and all that kind of stuff. But what's your take as a retired brigadier general on top military brass generals and others coming out and making comments about what's going on in society? You know, we had the Lafayette Square situation. Yeah, where there was a photo op there that and suddenly there were military personnel there and then um, the general came out and said, you know, kind of may a culprit after. I've not in my lifetime. I've not necessarily seen that ever happen before. What's your What's your take on that? Uh, it, it is very, very unusual. Um, you know, when you get up to the three and above me, up to the three and four star general ranks, that's a very small number of individuals, and they all know each other. Um, well, you know, when we had the Fort Hood shooting by Major Nadal Hassan, uh, and I was in charge of implementing. The, the recommendations, but the recommendations came from this group we call the Greybeards. You know, there are these the there are these retired generals at the three and four star level. As soon as we had that shooting, they like self convened. They contacted the, the, the Department of Defense and they and they came together as a group and gave us these recommendations, which were brilliant. Which are then sort of given to me to say, okay, you got to go institute all this. I think something very similar happened. Uh, after June 1st, when we saw the clearing of Lafayette Square of these peaceful protesters by the Washington, D.C. National Guard uh, and elements of Delaware, Pennsylvania and South Carolina National Guards, as well as uh, having the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General uh, uh, Milley there. I think it's like everybody says, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, the military, I mean, remember, we got these kids when they're 17 or 18 years old, and one of the things they have to do, just like every lawyer does, is they have to swear, they have to take an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. And they've got some, uh, uh, they are told, it's pounded into their heads that you do not take a loyalty oath to any one person. You take an oath to the Constitution and to the Constitution only. So by the time you get that and it, it becomes ingrained as you move up the ladder and you see the need for the, the for uh, the military and civilians uh, to be separate, uh, we really, really enforce that no politics rule as a result of that. And so what happened is Mark Milley, uh, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he got a lot of he got a lot of internal criticism. And when you have individuals that he knows and he's come through the ranks with publicly saying this cannot stand, then he had to, uh, as he did go, you know, in the uh, graduation address, commencement address to the National Defense University, specifically stay, say, I made a mistake, I apologize, we stay apart from civilian politics. Uh, and it's really that, and it's also that inherent, uh, uh, um, that's just beat into you, if you will, um, that you that your that your role is to uphold the Constitution, not anything else, and not anyone else. Yeah, 
again, we want to encourage folks to ask questions in the in the chat. I think this is probably a good transition to just generally talk about, you know, obviously you've been an attorney for a long time. Lawyers as leaders, you've played significant leadership roles, you know, in various parts of government and in the military. Um, for those those law students and those who are thinking about becoming a, a lawyer that might see this or recording of this program, um, kind of comment on the importance of, of leadership ability as an attorney. Yeah, uh, thanks for that, Paul. For those uh, out there, uh, we have this leadership academy that was started uh, some time ago at Cooley, a very strong program. Uh, and there are, there are, as part of that, not all of it, but as part of that, there is uh, two courses uh, one is taught by Dr. Zielinski and the other is taught by, by me, and it's a great class to teach, but it's based upon this simple but true notion, and that is lawyers, by their training, will be seen as leaders within the community, and that's absolutely true. I've seen so many times when somebody will say, well, you're a lawyer, what do you think? And everybody will stop and listen, even if it's on a matter of policy at school board, community level or state level. And, you know, it's it, you, you certainly have that need for to be seen, to be known as a leader because you are. So you have to self-perceive yourself as a, as a leader and know what it takes to be a leader. That also gets us, Paul, to talking about the idea of the rule of law, you know, the idea that... Um, you know, it, it's it's not unique to the United States. I mean, it started in England, uh, but it's the idea that the law is above uh, the norms, behaviors, ethos, and practices uh, of of society, and and it is above all others. The ascendancy, perhaps, is a better word of the law means it is elevated above all others, and it therefore influences uh, our our daily actions. And it's also then it's 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 the final arbiter. When we say the rule of law, we mean that the law rules. It is it is the final decision, and it's above everyone else. So uh, whether we talk about um, you know Lafayette Square when you you're, when you're using uh, military troops and militarized law enforcement to clear peaceful protesters, uh, whether you think about um, the decision uh, must have been Monday. Uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court in the Bostock case, in which they said that Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, when it says you can't discriminate against in employment based upon sex, applies to uh, gay, lesbian, and transgender. You know, that opinion, just to go on a quick tangent, that opinion was written by a, a, an individual perceived to be a rather conservative jurist. But if you read his opinion, he's like, He's going by the letter of the law. I mean, he's being a textualist, which conservatives usually do. And he says, it says sex. And if you've got two employees similarly situated, you know, same experience, same level, uh, and one's male and one's female, but they both happen to date men. And then you fire one because of that, because the man dates a man, then you're discriminating between your two employees based upon sex. And I'm oversimplifying to make a quick point, but it was an, but it was the idea that the Supreme court is saying, yep, you know, it's, it's above that political, uh, whatever political decision is, is seen to be correct. And they're saying, we're doing it based upon an interpretation of the law. It wasn't an interpretation of the Constitution, but it was an interpretation of the law. The other thing I'd say about the rule of law is it really is inherent um, within uh, the Constitution, especially when you look at 14th Amendment, the concept you know, that all, uh, all persons within this country are entitled to due process of law uh, is very powerful, as is the equal protection of the laws, that, that you can't treat people differently because you perceive them as, as different classes. Both of those are also inherent concepts within the, the overall concept of the rule of law codified in the Constitution, very relevant today. Yeah, uh, more than more than ever, I think. Continuing in, in that light, um, Marisol is asking, um, you know, given that talking about the duty to the U.S. Constitution, and not the individual, as opposed to like a president. Um, have you heard from other colleagues or anticipate any possible changes in the law to prevent the president from removing an executive officer without cause? Uh, I, I haven't heard that. Um... You, that that does get you into a tough constitutional uh, uh, area because um, you know the Constitution uh, gives implied powers uh, to the president in Article Two that we don't really see as so much in Article One with Congress, 
And the idea of those implied powers is even the idea of a cabinet. It's not spelled out uh, in the Constitution itself. It was you know, started by George Washington. Everybody thought it was a great idea. Um, so I, uh, you, you, you can assure um, that if it is for the enforcement of certain laws, um, as opposed to just the conduct of the chief executive himself, if it's for uh, uh, the enforcement of certain laws by the executive branch, that in that case, uh, you can certainly have a law that provides uh, a, a greater, greater independence uh, for an inspector general, for example. Um, but the Supreme Court's always already had a problem with the the Congress sort of injecting itself into. Uh, the executive branch and and having that individual uh, report to someone other than the chief executive. You can give right. them greater protections, but you can't reach you can't change that reporting uh, um, uh, format, uh, um, you know, structure org chart outside of the executive branch. Right, and, and again, this week we see the executive branch challenging, you know, freedom of expression, perhaps the freedom of the press, with John Bolton's book that's coming out. Um, and I don't. I don't know, it may have happened before. I can't. I can't recall kind of this this aggressive movement to keep a book out of circulation. Yeah, it's it's hap That's a really that's a good point. It's happened. Uh, I don't remember seeing it happen so publicly, uh, and I don't know whether or not that was a strategy started by Bolton's publisher to assure that you know they get buzz out there about the book, uh, or whether it's just you know, heavy handedness by the executive branch, by the White House at this point, because th those uh, those have occurred before. Um, there is a process in place and, uh, you know, you, you, you know, you sign. You know, uh, at a certain level, you sign an NDA. I signed an NDA and I said, well, I guess I won't take any notes on my time here um, just so it doesn't happen. Um, so what you have to do then is you have to get permission. And, and if, you know, when you look at compelling government interests, national security is always in, including the classification of information, uh, which if, if it's released, uh, could be deleterious to national security is always going to be a compelling government interest. And there's that balance there between are they really, uh, uh, you know, are they really uh, uh, trying to tell their story or are they and is it is it political or is it national security uh, is what it often comes down to and 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 in this case you know uh, it sounds like Bolton has, subje has subjected his book for review for uh, my gosh over a year now it sounds like and uh, I'm surprised if they couldn't have worked out all the edits by this point right not that you would you're you've ever been a judge but how does this end how do you think the book gets released and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess that book gets released, frankly. Um, you know, there's been a number of other books that have been released. Yeah, sure, he's National Security Advisor. Um, but, you know, we've had books out by individuals equally uh, of that stature, uh, you know, uh, a, a number of times. So um, I think it gets released. We have one of our colleagues, Brandon Berry, asking, from a leadership standpoint, how do you lead someone above you? That, you know, in your, kind of the chain of command, yeah, convincing a leader that there is a problem when he or she may not want to believe it or see it the same way that you as a subordinate may be viewing it, but may in fact have more detailed information about really what's going on. Yeah, that, you know, that's a great question. I'm smiling, Brendan, because when I went to the Pentagon, I mean, before I go there in a rather pompous fashion, I say to my wife, I said, I'm going to be a very deliberate, different kind of leader, you know, and than I was as a general there. And I know that and I'm going to make allowances and I'll be I'll, I'll be good at that. Well, as it turned out, individual above me was a, a, also a political appointee at the Department of Defense with no military experience whatsoever. And so uh, it turned out that probably two thirds of my job was my interaction with him as opposed to my subordinates. It was either to protect my subordinates when they came up with the right decision, but he didn't understand it. So I've got to catch the spears and arrows, you know, that are, that are, uh, you know, outrageous fortune that are coming down from above and be their shield, or I have to explain it to them so that that doesn't happen. And uh, the only thing I can tell you about that, Brendan, is that it has to, you have to be very diplomatic. 
You have to have a plan on how you're going to do that. Uh, the degree to which you can make it their own uh, plan is, and their own idea is very, very helpful. Uh, again, I would chunk it down. And, and so uh, to give you a, a real life example, um, uh, this goes right to the Insurrection Act after um, uh, after Katrina, uh, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act was changed, and the in the Insurrection Act was broadly expanded to say that the president uh, could call out military troops uh, without the governor's permission, and it can be either way in the Insurrection Act without the governor's permission uh, in cases of natural disaster, terrorist attack, et cetera, et cetera. Language that wasn't there at all. Nobody, I don't, nobody knows, nobody claims authorship to this or where it happens, but it comes out and uh, all 50 governors go nuts. You know, they, it doesn't matter whether they're Republican or Democrat, they see this for what it is, which is, you know, the Department of Defense and the president saying we can come in and we can take over uh, in, an, in, a, in an emergency caused by a natural disaster. It was in direct it was the confluence of two things. We had stood up Northern Command, which is the first time we had military forces that were to be used domestically within the United States, again, to thwart terrorist attacks, but they were then used uh, in response to Katrina. So we had them and then we had Katrina and we had a, 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 poor, uh, a poor showing uh, by both uh, the city of New Orleans and, and the state of Louisiana. So it was a confluence of those events. But when the, when the governor saw that they all went nuts, it immediately gets uh, repealed um, just very quickly. I mean, all 50 governors are calling their senators and saying, you got to take care of this, and they do it very quickly. So then you've got, uh, and then you've got Northern Command, you've got and saying, well, wait a minute. And, you know, the higher ups in, in the Pentagon are saying to, to my boss and I, because what we're doing is Homeland Defense, we're working with the states. We need a working relationship. How are we going to work with the states? You know, they don't want to work well with us except unless they go through FEMA, and that's not working. Sometimes we have to go in there directly. FEMA dropped the ball as well in Katrina. So my, my staff came up with a brilliant solution, and, uh, and we got to implement it. But what I had to do was say, take little pieces of that to my boss and say, what do you think about this? Or in your experience, did you ever run into this? And slowly feed pieces of that to him, but in the right order that it would build out uh, exactly what we needed to do. And we came up with this uh, drafting an executive order um, to create the Council of Governors. Uh, and, and it was 10 governors and it was uh, the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of Homeland Security, uh, director of FEMA, director of the Coast Guard, uh, a couple other individuals that would meet on a, a biannual basis uh, and talk about these common problems and give direction. Um, and so that was really cool. You know, I'd been there less than six months and there I was going to the White House on a regular basis because I was drafting this executive order for President Obama to sign. So that was a cool thing, uh, but I had to get it through my boss and then I had to have him think it's his idea, but have allow me to draft the thing which I did with my staff and it was and ran through the interagency process, as I said, and up to the way. Then, then your boss took credit, right? Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's okay. That's part of it, Brendan. You got to yeah, let them take credit. Follow that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, sure. Another one of our colleagues, Mabel Martin Scott, is asking about implied power of the president being above the law. Members of the Supreme Court suggest this. What do you think about this position from a constitutional law perspective, the president being above the law? Yeah, the, you know, if you look at, un unlike um, in Article One of the Constitution, dealing with the powers of, of Congress, where they're all sort of spelled out, you know, the powers of, of the president are not. There is clearly left to the president uh, a wide discretion uh, and including implied powers. You know, if, when a clause say the president will take care that the laws are faithfully executed, the manner in which he takes care that that is done is clearly left to the president to do so. That being said, though, that doesn't mean that the president is above the law. It goes back to what we were saying about the rule of law, which is codified in the Constitution. The concept of the law uh, over everything is codified in the Constitution, uh, and, and the president isn't above that. You know, I think what we see, if there are concerns with the actions of, of the president, it's more a result of the Congress not exercising all the checks and balances that Congress could exercise against the president. 
uh, you know, starting with uh, voting for certain measures, uh, criticizing certain measures that the president does, uh, voting countervailing measures. Uh, we saw it a couple times. You know, we saw a resolution go out uh, cont contrary to the president when he tried to uh, uh, move too quickly into uh, out of Iraq, um, but in our in Syria as well. Um, but there is. I think more than anything, the structure is still there, but it's got to be used. You know, it goes all the way back to the um, the famous uh, Youngstown sheet and tube case, the, the steel mills case with President Truman uh, trying to shut down or, or really to militarize, I should say, uh, have have troops run the, the mills when the unions were on strike during the Korean War and they needed the iron. And you had uh, and he the President Truman ignored the Taft Hartley Act, which had just been passed by Congress. So the Supreme Court said in the most famous case that, uh, you know, the president's powers were at their lowest ebb when they are contrary to the power of Congress. But there's a but but Justice Frankfurter's concurring opinion in that case gives us a real a, a strong warning message because he says a line of precedent if, if there if the president acts over and over again without the Congress objecting, then the president can sort of expand his powers is, is what Frankfurter was suggesting. We're looking at what Congress allows the president to do. So I think that's what's happened in the last 50 to 60 years is there's been this, there's been this growth of the executive branch of the federal government because Congress has not been willing to exercise their powers. They expect the Supreme Court to do it, but the judicial branch has always said you know, we don't get involved in the political process or very rarely when it involves the rights of, of individuals and interpretation of the of a section of the Constitution. But if it's a conflict between the two political branches, the, the legislative and executive, we leave that to president. We leave it to Congress and Congress has allowed the president to act without stopping them. And that's happened. You know, it's happened with every president, usually under um, whether or not they can commit, you know, U.S. troops abroad without having a, a clear authorization to do so, uh, but it happens in other avenues as well. And as a result of that, we've had an expanded executive branch. Congress needs to let that pendulum swing back a little bit and seize some of their own power. Well, is the is the prevalence of the executive order a symptom of a failing government? Uh, no, it's not. Um, the the federal government has to act through executive orders, um, but. That being and, and and happens all the time, and you know most of them don't cause any uh, any public uh, uh, uproar or even uh, uh, just a ripple. Um, but when 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 it is an action uh, which is contrary to the intent of Congress in a previous act, then then we need Congress needs to act and and reject that executive order. Uh, um, through having hearings on it, calling in the individuals, saying this is the power that was delegated to you, and only that power. The president can't act any further than that, and then take further action if that is unsuccessful. If the oversight doesn't work, then they have to, you know, take the power of the person, the power to enact laws. Got it. Mike, uh, can, I, can Mike weigh in on a, on a real yeah. hot topic right now? Absolutely. Mike. What, what's oh, going what's going to happen with Bolton, man? Is he? Uh, I'm fascinated from the the remedies in and the injunction and the First Amendment notion, the uh, the 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 fact that he's talking about classified information being passed on, even though he's also calling it lies too. I'm wondering uh, what if you know if you if you've got the history of why he didn't testify during the impeachment proceedings. My understanding is that he didn't he didn't speak because he knew this book was coming. He knew he might have to speak to classified information. He didn't want to. He didn't want to voluntarily speak. He thought it'd be more more appropriate, um, or or more legal, if indeed he was compelled to do so by subpoena. The uh, the Congress, the the House, nor the Senate eventually would subpoena him. I'm wondering if, uh, although there is some suggestion that the reason he didn't volunteer to speak is because he knew his book was coming and he didn't want to sabotage anything that might be associated with the with the interest in his book by by speaking on those matters in advance. But I'm wondering, wondering if these are these raise real constitutional issues when it comes to right now them being able to enjoin him from selling his book, and then also 
the history of why he didn't speak during the uh, impeachment proceedings, if you're familiar enough with that. Yeah. So uh, you raised a couple issues there. First, the usual remedy, um, if the book is published, is that you forfeit uh, you forfeit the profits from the book. As, if I recall, there's a statute on that, uh, though I don't remember the specifics, Mark, on that. Um, that so, is true. It, it would go into trust. So right. he, essentially, essentially, he would be by his sales of the book and by his any any honorarium or fee that he might he might obtain uh, based on him speaking about the book or his career at the at the uh, with the government would essentially go into trust with those proceeds uh, eventually making their way back to the government. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so other national security advisors have written books. I mean, Madeleine Albright just put out her second book. It's not, it's, it's not uh, the, 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 the position so much as what might be in the book. And there's a whole process in the statute by which the, 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 the White House or the concerned agency, as well as the publisher, are supposed to work through those issues with the author and say, is there another way to say this to assure that the book is published without classified information being released? So there's a process out there for doing that. Um, I don't really remember the process with, with uh, 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 Bolton, but it, I, I do recall that uh, it seems to me that he had one of his uh, his uh, top deputies, I think his name was Gary Kupperman, and had him sort of um, file a, a declaratory action to see whether or not they should, uh, whether or not they should testify or not. My recollection is that it all fizzled out because the court declined to answer what it saw at that point as either uh, a, a, an unripe question uh, or a political question. And of course, um, uh, he declined to uh, um, uh, uh, speak without a subpoena. So he, the more patriotic thing you could argue he should have done is he should have um, he should have gone he should have agreed to speak, uh, and then you know the White House could have sought to enjoin uh, him from doing so, uh, but he took the other route obviously, and I I guess I'm not going to speculate on his reasons for doing so, whether it was to sell books or whatever. Thanks. Um, you know, earlier you talked about when you have big, big items as a leader that you're trying to resolve or, or transform to another place. You, you talk about creating small wins so that people can feel the movement in, in, in right. the effort. Um, and I'd, I invite our audience to to kind of chat in on this too, if you have any thoughts. What what should our society look toward for small wins in the the killing of of, of Black Americans? almost daily it seems like now over the last few weeks here what are how do we create small wins what does a small win look like with such an important and devastating situation we're going through right now i, I invite you mike obviously to, to yeah. comment let, but also others sort of, well. yeah i'll lead off the discussion and then invite others obviously because i think everybody can have a point on this but this is one issue in which there has to be thousands of leaders uh, not just a single leader um, it, it has to uh, uh, arise, uh, you know, that, that I, that, you know, it's a 60s phrase to talk about a movement, but that really what we're talking about when we say movement is really a shift in perceptions by the majority of people. There has to be a shift in acceptance by a majority of the people. So it's it, when we talk little wins, it's things like Roger Goodell uh, apologizing, you know, it's uh, it's uh, Quaker Oats uh, banning Aunt Jemima. You know, it's NASCAR banning Confederate flags. It's it's going to be small wins, but there has to be a, a continuous. You know, this is a ripple now in change, and it's got to become a flood. And it's not a, at a flood stage yet. It can happen, and it can happen quickly. Uh, you know, you think about the acceptance of gays in in America. That that was almost like a, a light switch. How quickly that changed. It's it 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 to me it's um it's it 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 is just uh, the the greatest embarrassment of our country uh that we haven't uh, uh solved this issue of racial polarization yet and solve is probably the wrong verb it has to but it is going to take a lot of little wins and thousands of leaders out there are saying yes we've got to change this and looking inward and say what what have we done or what can we change and saying i'm not going to tolerate this anymore um you know, I, I was uh, I was talking with friends this weekend, and one of them says, 
you have to go from being a non-racist to being an anti-racist. We have to change the, the thought process there. So it's not enough for you to say, I, you know, I won't do that. You can't tolerate anyone else doing that. If you see a Confederate flag, you know, even on a guy's pickup, you, instead of looking the other way, you got to say you're a moron. You know, we got to speak out and say, uh, you know, that may be your speech, but I will, uh, but I do not tolerate that. So it, it, it it's going to take that shift and it's going to take those thousands of little victories uh, before we get there. You know, we're seeing a lot of community activists come forward and, and create the movement that you talk about. But in, in the in the traditional structure of government, is the, does the power, if that's the right terminology, lie with the mayor? of towns and cities to kind of really address the policing issue, really address, um, you know, disparate funding of a variety of different programs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. can, can a president, can a governor, can a, can a person or a corporate executive, are they yeah. really in a position to affect the small wins that you try to achieve? Sure. If we're talking about um, uh, racial injustice inherent within the criminal justice system, starting with law enforcement, uh, then it's every level of government. Lo you know, local law enforcement gets funds from the Department of Justice. They get funds from the state, and they get funds from uh, their their local tax base as well. And it's a combination of funding there. Um, so yeah, it, that requires attention at all levels of government uh, and to to be done. And you know, some of those have to be addressed with the federal government. Uh, this the idea of a national database of law enforcement. Uh, is is a good idea but hard to implement the idea though of transparency um and it can be a condition of receiving federal funding to, to assure that it happens within every every state the idea of transparency of, of allegations of use of force uh or, or and broader than that uh other forms of, of of police brutality related to race or other means all of that uh, uh, could be mandated by the federal government as a condition of funding that you have to have transparency, that you can't hide behind some union rule that you crafted, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah, of late we're seeing the police unions be more demonstrative in their in their kind of a kind of a wall pushing against, you know, um, and we have Atlanta where we have police officers that are calling in sick in great numbers yeah. and in other communities. Um, you know, I, I, how do you, how do you, and this is not just for you, General McDaniel, but for others too, how do you create um, an environment where, where you have the, the appropriate level of, of community involvement in making big decisions in that community? So here you have a portion of the community, the police officers, some police officers, not all, some police officers saying, I'm not coming to work for whatever reason, whether it be as a matter of protest or concern about their own safety. Who knows, right? How do you get a community to to come together in in ways that have, that it can affect some meaningful change, so that you have the police officers, or you have the community activists, you have the the government entities, and you have you know the folks that are, are most impacted by the by the by the acts of of others against their because of their race. I think people are just searching for the answer, an, an answer or a little answer to or a little win here to kind of move us forward. Any any words of wisdom from where you said and kind of what you've seen over the course of your career? Yeah, I think we have to sort of break the stranglehold that police union, unions have uh, on their communities. You know, it, it um, you look at uh, California's financial circumstances and it's because uh, of, you know, the, the police and other unions just were able to require uh, so many benefits there. And it's like, I'm pro union. Don't get me wrong on that, but when you see like this, the city of Buffalo, where all 57 individuals uh, who are members of the special response team for the city police department say, well, forget it then, you know, if we can't push old men, 75 year old men to the ground, then we're gonna quit, we're gonna quit the special resp response team. Uh, it's, a, it's a show of force by the police union when they do something like that. And, and it caused the mayor to react you know, favorably to the to the police department because he didn't want to be he didn't want to be left without a, a special response team, which everybody volunteers to be on. So uh, there has to be um, it 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 has to be that at the community level that we're having those discussions, and it means that we have to keep up 
the, uh, the we have to keep up the protests. We have to keep up the 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 ability to capture people's attention so that we can then have that dialogue. Uh, I, I, you know, I am uh, heartened and strengthened by the by the fact that uh, that these protests are still going strong. And, it, you know, it's been since May 31st. That's that shows that there's still that need there and that people are still concerned with assuring that we get uh, the solutions that we need. But for local police, you know, we have to go back to that and we can't just as you know, we can't just assume that um, they are always going to act out of the 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 best interests of the of the citizens of the city. Most and you know, ninety nine percent, I think, and hope that they will. But we have to be able to say, look, this isn't an individual officer problem. We've created some systemic problems with the rise of the protections that police unions have asked for, uh, have demanded, and and have received. That's a tough conversation to have, but I, I think we have to have that conversation. Sure. And then, and then maybe we just have a few minutes left here. Um, you know, we are also seeing the significant role that attorneys are playing um, on, on these two big issues that, you know, with, with racial injustice and as well as um, the, the pandemic. Um, you know, you see the, you know, yesterday I was watching the news and you see the district attorney for um, down in Atlanta, you know, come out with the charges. You see the, the defense attorneys coming out defending the the officer that did not shoot, um, you see, you know, kind of the um, uh, the victims attor victims attorneys coming forward. How does how does how do we prepare our stu our students for this? And how do they, yeah. you know, the, the important role that that lawyers have has always played in, in right. solving society's worst moments, if you will. Yeah, I you know I, I watched a lot of that last night too, and I I mean I thought it was great because. You saw that you, you saw the district attorney laying out all of his reasons, and then you saw the criminal defense attorney trying to rebut all of those. Um, and as a result of that, I learned a lot more about that case, you know, that I didn't know before. You know, I defended state police for ten years on use of force cases uh, when I was in state government, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, so uh, they are, you know, uh, the victim was turning with this 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 weapon in his hands and toward, pointing it towards the police sounds like a good shoot to me but then we got all the other details about you know they they kicked the guy at, and, and they left him lying there and they're pinning the guy down uh you know they didn't call an ambulance right away all the other factors that sort of go to uh, a, a a criminal intent which which i hadn't seen on the news prior to that and then you had as you said you had the the debate with the criminal defense attorney saying how much is the other officer supposed to do and and if he doesn't act immediately to stop this officer at what what point does that become a, a criminal inactivity on his part so i thought it was a really good debate i think we should be using you know we should be talking about those examples i mean it's you know this is a great time to be teaching law school or going to law school because we've got so much out there which we have an opportunity to impact you know as you say you know we could you know, the, the the attorneys are sort of leading this discussion uh and they're being leaders in the community just like we were talking about at the beginning of the hour Paul. paul so i think that's fantastic um, and that's a perfect example. It's an, you know, we can use that case in criminal, uh, in criminal law. We can use it in PPR and, and personal and professional responsibility. Uh, we can use it in our leadership class. There's lots of, uh, there's a lots of real life examples like that out there um, that show the need for lawyers to be engaged and the need for lawyers to resent, to represent individuals who do want to affect change. Uh, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, going back to George Floyd, I, I heard on one of the conservative um, s uh, stations, I forget which, or I wouldn't name if I did, but they said something like, well, George Floyd's not a martyr. He was a criminal because he had a counterfeit $20 bill. And I thought, wow, see, there's a really good example why we have to have this conversation and say, what is a martyr? Because I kind of think he is. The fact that he may have had a counterfeit $20 bill doesn't change the fact that he became a martyr to a pretty important cause. Yeah, yeah that's, and this is probably a good place to stop and talking about the role of attorneys and, of course, um, the devastating loss of, of George Floyd. You know, we thank you, Professor McDaniel, for, for taking the time out. And, and this has been a really nice conversation and really timely, obviously. Thank all of you for participating today and particularly our future lawyers that may be with us um, for, today, for attending today's W. McCooley conversation. And, and next Thursday, we will have a conversation with President and Dean James McGrath. 
We discuss education, healthcare, and, and, and as we celebrate Pride Month, LBGTQ rights. Until then, see you next time, but let's take care of each other. Be safe out there. Oh.